Hello, Dr. Moore. So I'll be talking to you about a lesson called Mental Workspace Exam Preparation. Now there's another lesson previously we covered was Mental Workspace um, Memory Organization. But this one we're gonna actually talk about what is a mental workspace and how do you create a personal one for you. So this idea of mental workspace I had mentioned previously is very similar to creating a memory palace in your mind. And the idea is that if you can create a space in your mind that you can organize your thoughts and place them in a very specific way, then it's easier for you to then go into that space and take that information out later. And in this particular lesson, you're gonna be thinking about what things make you feel comfortable? Is it being out in nature? Is it being near the water? Is it being near the beach? Is it being on a mountain? Or is it being in a physical structure? And then from that, how do you create a physical representation, a visual representation of your mental workspace? Now I've seen some students just have one room and in that room they have a dry eraser board, they have a periodic table, they may have just a physical table with chairs and each chair when they're sitting in that room in their mind then they can go through and study their physics. In another chair they study their math, in another chair, chair they study biology or you can have separate rooms. I, my, I would encourage you to start off very simple and just create one room that has all the accoutrements of comfort that make you feel comfortable and have the things in there that will allow you to remember things and place things into context. And from that, we will build upon that in the lessons to come in a way where we can take this mental workspace and really use it when it's exam time to be able to win. All right, so um, welcome everybody. Excited to uh, get a chance to engage you guys again. Um, this lesson is gonna be on mental workspace, exam preparation. So let me have um, Jessica, can you read that, that quote for us real quick at the top of this lesson? Ordinary people believe only in the possible. Extraordinary people visualize not what is possible or probable, but rather what is impossible. And by visualizing the possible, they begin to see it as possible. All right, so what do you think um, Sharice Scott is saying with that? Regular people might only set a limit for themselves on what they can think they can do, versus other people might um, see that they can achieve um, like higher things and surpass their limits. Okay. Other people may set limits. Other people that are extraordinary can see things and try to move past those limits. Anybody else want to add anything to that quote? I think it also talks about how, like, confidence and like optimism, <clears throat> it's not important to have in the mindset of someone who is um, striving for success. All right, I like, I like that you brought up mindset and you brought up confidence. So you have to believe that you're capable or that something is capable as well, or it's just not gonna happen, right? If we believe that things, something is too hard, then it's gonna be too hard, right? It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Did anybody in virtual land wanna, wanna add anything? All right, I don't see any hands. All right, so what I'm gonna in introduce you is this idea of what I call mental workspace. And mental workspace is this place within your mind where you think and you process information, right? You can call it your headspace, but it's the space that, you know, as you're reading something, as you're learning, as you're putting in concepts into your mind, you know, it's this place where you're trying to organize it and you're trying to think through and develop relationships to the information that you're learning. And if you're able to do that um, in a way that, that um, works for how you process information, the most efficient way for how you process information, then it's a very powerful way to be able to master your thoughts and be able to create, right? And that's kind of what we want to do as students of science is be able to take in information and apply it, 
right? We're not in the discipline of taking in information to, to just because we want facts, right? You want to be able to take in information and make a relationship to it and say, okay, how can I use this at some point in the future to build a bridge or heal somebody through medicine or whatever that may be, right? And so, um, so we want to have a higher level of how we go about um, not only, um, you know, designing this mental workspace in a way that works for us, but being able to like have it be effective as well. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and switch to page one. So what we want to do and spend a few time, a few minutes thinking about is how do we create a mental workspace that works for you? And you know, I'm gonna take a step back and just say. Did anybody see that movie, Silence of the Lamb? They yeah, have that character, Hannibal Lecter. Okay, I see some people not in virtual land. Okay, so it's passion. Okay, well, it's, it's, a, it's like one of those like psychological thriller type of movies, but the main character is this doctor that turns in, ends up being a serial killer, but he has this phenomenal memory, and you know, if you read his books, he has, and he created this mind what they call memory palaces. So if you think about it, like, you know, back before I had phones, um, you know, when I was your guys' age, maybe a little younger, like I could store like 50 phone numbers in my mind. Like I would meet somebody, be like, shoot me your number, and I would lock it in, be like, boom, I got it, right? And I could recall it at will. Now I probably got about three in a possible in my mind, right? So the phone, has hindered me from further developing that muscle because I don't have to develop it anymore. But if you think about people thousands of years ago before there were computers, people were orators, people who, who, um, who um, were writing down history, or people who just needed information, they had to find ways to actually keep it for long periods of time because they didn't really have the internet and any of those things where they could just look something up, right? And so what they would do is they would create these memory palaces in their mind where this mesa, this center could be a, a room in your mind, and each thing in the room, you can call it a low side, could be something that you actually attach information to, right? And so you can take ideas and thoughts, and you can organize them in a very efficient way. So even if, say, we, we were thinking about um, the astrology sign, right? There's 12 um, astrology symbols, so if you think about or these 12 spots that could be starting with Capricorn and then moving on to um, Aquarius and then Pisces. So each one of them could be a low sign that you, that you stored information on, right? And if you stored it in a very organized way, you could then go back and move either to the right and go Capricorn, Aquarius, Pisces, and you could go back and go Sagittarius, um, Scorpio, Libra. But you could have 12 spots that you could put information on. Now think about if each one of these had 10 houses that were attached to Aquarius. Right? If you, whatever you attach to Aquarius, you actually could attach 10 more bits of information to it in a very organized way. So now you move from 12 spots to 120 spots. But you see how I'm saying that you could really begin to organize a lot of information in these, like, these memory palaces. And so people can have a mansion with multiple rooms and the ability to just store a lot of information. But what I'm focusing on now is just you customizing one room. And this room is something that you can go into and begin to you know, make personal to you in a way that really makes sense. So the first part of this exercise is for you to think about properties and elements in an environment that make you feel at peace or tranquil. So for me, I like being around water, um, I also like being on perches where I can see things. You know, you have that line that's looking over the, the valley. Um, but I also like being in uh, forestry areas, especially around redwoods. But think about a place that makes you feel tranquil 
And it could also be in, you know, a physical building. But I want you to just spend a few minutes and just jot something down, like a few words down that kind of describes what that place may look like. Go ahead. Oh, the first couple of times I was in the office, mm -hmm. uh, some of the sound of the trees okay, that, you know, uh, it really uh, give me a feeling of push my mind to turn them. Mm -hmm. So, so this place, I'm glad you brought that up, could have sound there, right? It could, it could be near the water. It could be, as you're saying, these trees that are bristling back and forth, and that could make you feel that peace as well. So you want to be able to, in this space, describe the things that are, you know, special to you, and that you can kind of be able to see, but also feel, if that makes any sense. So just take a minute or two and just jot, jot this down. And then we'll, we'll move on to the next piece. So I'm going to go ahead and start speaking about the next part. And I want you to incorporate that into this initial idea. So you could also have, for this next part, it could be a single room or it could be multi-structural. Multi but right now, I want you to just focus on a single room. and. So this room could have glass walls around it. You can still see and feel the things around you. It could be a structure that makes sense for you. Maybe it's even your room, potentially, that's in this particular place. But I want you to think about and I want you to describe what it looks like in there. And so you can place in this mental workspace things that actually maybe um, are important for the courses that you're taking right now. So say, if you're taking chemistry, maybe you have a periodic table that's you know on the wall in this room. And you can see in your mind's eye in this room all of the elements lined up. Um, maybe there's a couch in there because you may do better studying when you're laying or sitting on a couch. But put in this room all the things that you believe that you would, um, you would need to be able to think and create at your best, if that makes any sense. Does anybody have any questions about what I'm describing right now? So go ahead and finish those last thoughts. And what we're going to do for this next part is we're going to break up into groups. For the people in virtual land, we're going to separate you guys into uh, two separate groups. And I want you to describe what your mental workspace is to the people in your group. Maybe you two, I'll have you guys maybe come to this table and be a part of these folks. But I want you guys to describe to your, your colleagues and your peers what this mental workspace looks like for you. All right, we're gonna go ahead and come back real quick. So, um, did you, anybody feel like they got some different ideas about their mental workspace based on talking to your peers that you may wanna add or subtract from yours? I show hands. Go ahead. Um, I'm sorry, what was your name? Yeah, he had mentioned like having some type of toy or something to be in the room. Mm -hmm. and I think I don't often want to take a break, so I don't ever prioritize like, oh, when I do need to step away, what what would I be distracting myself with? So um, I feel like that's definitely something I need to incorporate and okay. so I can take some time. So maybe like even a fidget toy or something like that? Or? Yeah. Okay, I like that. Anybody else want to do something? Yeah, I would. Mm -hmm. And so Ali mentioned um, the time of day mm -hmm. and also like the temperature. She mentioned how like she doesn't like it too cold and it's kind of same for me. I don't like it too cold or too hot. Like yeah. the, the middle temperature is optimal for me. Okay. And also I can't really study like that well at night. So um, anytime during the day is when I would work best and that's when my um, Okay, so we talked about the temperature needs to be at 72, 68, whatever that is. Um, you want to have some light in there so you can, you know, do your best thinking when it's when there's light out. I like that. Anybody in virtual land want to share anything that they may have learned from theirs? Hello, you can see me. You can hear me. Yeah. Okay, cool. Sweet. Um, I think that we all kind of share like the same 
kind of like basic necessities, like being having quiet, um, having a workspace that you know suits our needs for whatever that task is at at the time. Um, organizing yourself with to do lists and uh, tasks. Um, I also when uh, I was also thinking myself about like a mental workspace and what that means to me. Um, uh, like as of late, I've come to the realization like I have to kind of get myself ready to absorb the information and kind of like bring up um, that subject um, like in my mind to the forefront to be able to like gather whatever information that I'm about to absorb and like relate it to the rest of, um, you know, the rest of the course or whatever else that I'm uh, about to learn. So, nice. yeah. So, you know, you can have um, a mental workspace for each class that you have, you know, um, you know, you could have a table and, and different seats at the table could represent, you know, a different subject area as well too. But think about this as a sanctuary. And I'm just gonna also mention that this can be a place that you go to under pressure to do your best thinking, right? To block out everything around you and to be able to go to this place and sit down with your ambient lighting with the temperature on point and to, to do your best thinking. So one of the things that we didn't cover is you finding a consistent way to go into this space. Right, and it could be that you open up a door, it could be, you know, you put in a quick little keypad, it could be two tops on your skin, it, whatever it is, you just want to find a way to easily slide into this space to then be able to kind of activate, you know, the comfort and tranquility in the information that you're storing there, if that makes sense. All right, so moving forward, Creative visualization, and all of this is being built on our ability to begin to see, right, what we want to create. So there was an experiment that they did in the Soviet Union, back when it was the Soviet Union, um, around their athletes. And what they did is they had four groups of athletes. They had group one that did 100% physical training. They had group two that did 75% physical training and 25% creative visualization. Group three was 50-50, and group four was 25% um, physical training but 75% creative visualization. What group do you believe did the best when it came to performing as an athlete for the Olympics? Probably the last one. Okay, we said the last one. Okay, why do you believe so? Because um, <clears throat> if you're performing in the Olympics, it's a lot of pressure. First off, you're in front of the whole world, you know. <laughs> so it's going to take. I think personally, I think it'd take a little more than twenty-five percent, or even fifty percent mental preparation. And and here's the thing: is like if you were doing one hundred percent physical everything, there's only like even for an athlete, there's only so much you can put into your body every day. You know, before you're overworking yourself, mm -hmm. um, and uh, even preparing for the Olympics. Like by the time you get there, you'll put your body through a lot, but um, not all of it's necessarily going to be uh, beneficial to your performance. It could just be, you know, uh, overworking, putting too much stress on, you know, um, parts of your body that you're working on. So I mean, twenty-five percent seems like a solid amount for <laughs> for physical uh, enrichment to me. Okay. Anybody else want to add, subtract from that virtual land? Because people got opinions about this, so don't act like y'all ain't got no opinions. <laughs> but being shy around one another. Um, I think definitely mental preparation um, is important, especially for athletes. Like, if you're being considered for the Olympics, chances are you have done the training beforehand to even be considered a contender. Mm -hmm. So, I don't think the physical is the, I mean, it's important, but it's not the highest priority because at the end of the day, you could psych yourself out, and I think they should be training on preventing that from happening. Mm -hmm. So, I think a lot more uh, mental uh, exercises and confidence building would be more important. Okay. So, it was group four, and the one that was 25% physical and 75% mental and for whatever reason, you know, when they can hit cook up um, 
you know, monitors to the brain of these athletes and they run the race physically and then they run their race in their mind, it looks exactly the same. <laughs> so your, your body doesn't know the difference. Right? <laughs> so it looks exactly the same because, again, you're visualizing and you're thinking it, and maybe you're sending that signal to you know, your body to react and move, but it looks exactly the same in regards to how your brain is processing it and trying to you know, go through what you're seeing right, in your mind. And so I don't know if it allows you, things to flow faster, maybe it allows your emotions because you're, you're opening up those pathways for your, your body to react faster or whatnot. But this is something that a lot of athletes is more prevalent now. Um, I had a chance at one point to meet, um, uh, you know, one of the one of these ice skaters, uh, Michelle Kwam. He won like five like gold medals in the U.S. Olympics. And one of the things I asked her was how she prepared for, you know, her skating meets because I'm like, you know, she's extraordinary at what she did, and obviously she's doing it at a high level. And but one of the things she told me was is that she said that. One, at one point, she either sprained her leg or broke her leg. I think I think she's had a hard sprain on it where she couldn't like she couldn't skate for like a month. And she said, "I did creative visualizations every day." She says my routine was four minutes and twenty one seconds, and I could do it in my mind in four minutes and eighteen seconds. So, yes, there's power there, right? She's practicing in her mind, and you see that with you know. People who play basketball, visualizing is three seconds left, I'm jumping, I'm in the flow, I'm taking that shot, the rim is opening up, right? So all these things are things that right now is a lot more prevalent where we're starting to see the power of creative visualization. And I want you guys to then convert some of these tactics and techniques to your exams, right? We're gonna get back to your exams. So, the steps that we need for, create, for creating your reality is first, the first step is to get to know your goal intimately, right? So that's spending time exploring what the process could look like, what steps are there to completing that goal. You know, sit with the idea and thoughts and then create strong intentions. So your intentions lead, they lead what manifestation is. Right, you want to be clear on these. These are my intentions to to manifest that, and that and have clarity around it. Right, we don't want to be ambiguous. We want to be like, I want to get an A on this exam. Period. I believe and know that I can get an A, and that's what that's what my goal is. Um, then you want to bring your creative energy to the process. So, and the creative energy is also in my mind your emotions. I believe your creativity energy flows along those emotional channels. So you're op you want to open up your mind to the infinite ways, right? Because sometimes we get fixated on this has to happen this way. But there's multiple pathways for you to manifest what you want. And maybe sometimes it's the, you know, when you think you didn't get what you want, the, what actually happens ends up being better than the way you thought that it could actually manifest. So we want to be open to that. And we want to be able to write down our thoughts. So it's almost like you have, um, we want to go from our thoughts to our words, because speaking things have power too. When we speak things, that is us transmitting energy mm -hmm. to then our actions, right, our deeds. So we want to be able to flow. We want to be able to receive what we believe we want, right? We want to be able to then uh, see it and write it down and visualize it with intentions. And then we want to be able to then put the work in, right? We want to be able to study appropriately so we can then manifest. So the third step is visualize our goals. And then this last step is create positive affirmations to support your vision. So. Sometimes, you know, we can be vulnerable around specific subject areas or even the discipline that we're deciding that we want to go into, right? Sometimes we could be going into a class and saying, I'm going to get an A in this class, but unconsciously, you know, your mind is like, no, you're about to get a C, right? So we want to make sure that our conscious thoughts align with 
our unconscious thoughts. So another way to visualize that is, since we're scientists, we have this wave, right? And in this wave, these are our conscious thoughts. And a conscious thought is, I want to get an A, right? But our unconscious thoughts <laughs> are, you're about to get a C, <laughs> right? You see how they're canceling each other out? I'm not sure if the people on the board can kind of see that, but they're canceling each other out. You want to make sure your conscious thoughts and your unconscious thoughts are in the same phase, right? Because if they're in the same phase, then they're a lot more powerful, right? And they're not catching each other out. They're amplifying one another. And that's how you win. But one way to begin to maybe neutralize these unconscious thoughts is sometimes we just don't know what exists. It could be something that happened to you when you were in third grade and you had a teacher say you're not good at math. It could be a family member that says you ain't about to be nothing or whatever, whatever. It could be what you feel society believes that you're capable of. Whatever it may be, you know, our job is to identify that and eliminate it if it's not, if it's not adding to us manifesting our goals, right? So creating positive affirmations is a good look to begin to build yourself up because all of this is going to come down to your own self-confidence. You have to be your best cheerleader. If you don't believe in yourself, it doesn't make a difference what other people believe. You're just, you're not going to accomplish at the same level. So when, when, when stuff hits the fan, you need, you need that inner voice say, I'm capable. I'm strong enough. I'm smart enough. Let's go. Right? And you can go into your mental workspace and be there. So, you know, you could even have, you know, a little small box, a little tape recorder in your mental workspace that's giving you positive affirmations when you get there. Stop, relax, open up, and a solution exists. Wait for it to come to you. Calm down, relax. You're smart enough, you're capable enough, you got this, right? You need, you need, you need those, those things to always be playing in your mind and it's gonna allow you to then open yourself up more for a solution, especially under pressure, than tightening up and trying to contract when you get scared and that fear may kick in, if that makes any sense. Any thoughts, any comments about what we talked about thus far? Anybody in virtual land? No, actually, um, I, uh, two things. One, I have to go in a second because I have the class starting. But um, earlier, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you said something. I forgot actually which part it was, but it made me think of something music related. So, um, uh, when you're when you're playing the drums, right? You spend a lot of time. Well, here's how you here's how you get good, and here's how you sound good. Um, you spend a lot of time with the metronome doing the same thing over and over. And then when you sit behind a drum set, you are feeling every single note that you play in practice, um, but you're only letting certain ones hit. Every, it just becomes a, a underlying instinctual thing. And then you are just, cause that's what I was with the mental, um, mental training and physical training, it's kind of what I thought of. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you've, you've taught yourself to you don't have to think about any of the notes. Mm -hmm. um, you are, you're already, it's already automatic. Um, so you're, it's all, um, yeah, it's, it's almost 100% visualization at that point. Mm -hmm. um, when you're actually playing, you're just, you're just allowing certain ones to hit. Um, so when you, when you see drummers do like crazy fills and stuff, it's all because they're already, they're already playing all those notes. Wow. So yeah. I just wanted to, I just wanted to share that and add to that analogy. That's kind of, Head. No, thank you for sharing that. It's powerful. Yeah. And it's almost like you're in this zone where, you know, things slow down and you, yeah. you really are in your own world. Just exactly. Yeah. Well, one question for you. Where, where do you notice yourself into? Um, one more time? Oh, I was wondering, when are you know that you no longer need to know, but you're, you are capable of? You never do. You just keep getting better. You 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 always. I, I you have to practice every single day, um, and you can you can ask 
find if you ever meet someone who's like the best drummer in the world and ask them, when did you stop learning? They're, they're, they haven't. You just keep you just keep getting better. And the moment you stop learning, you start getting rusty. So, um, but as far as like um, learning uh, learning what notes not to hit. Um, so here's from my personal experience. Uh, I was initially self-taught, and I would look at what other drummers were doing, and I would just copy it, you know. And I'd end up getting pretty close, but it was still kind of sloppy. And I learned how to practice effectively, which is not trying to copy what someone else is doing, not trying to uh, do what I'm seeing happening, but to very um, rigorously and painstakingly learn to play every single note in, in time. There's certain rudiments you can practice, like, and you just sit there for hours. Well, not necessarily hours, you can handle it. But you get it, you get it um, really baked in to where you don't have to think about playing it. I just, you know, and then if I want to play a rhythm, um, I just don't hit certain ones, you know. And uh, you just, you're still feeling them. Oftentimes, you still, you have still physical impulse to playing them. But you think, oh, here's something I want to play, and then you just allow the certain ones to go. So it's just, it's all, it comes totally mental because the physical is already on lock. So, yeah, I don't know. Just, just a kind of little cool thing to add to the, the athlete um, bit there. Yeah, I mean, so, so it's, it's, there's a, there's a really good book that came out, you know, 20 something years ago called Now Discover Your Strengths. And it's a book that I used to do workshops around. But in that book, they identified like, I want to say 32 or 36 different strengths. And they basically say for a strength, and I'm just, I'm just bringing this up because I think it adds to this conversation. I'm going to look at that book that we started five minutes ago. Um, so for a strength, it has three components. It has a talent, and a talent is a reoccurring thought feeling or activity that happens in your mind, right? A reoccurring thought, feeling, or activity. And then the, the second component is um, a skill. And skills are just steps to an activity, right? Someone's done this before and they broke it into steps and they're telling you how to develop that skill. And then the last part is knowledge. So. That could be factual knowledge, or it could be experiential knowledge. But it's what you gain through doing the activity and learning, right? And if you have all three of these, then that thing can be a strength where you can see near perfect consistency every time. But the most important component of this is the talent. Right, like we're all, all of our, um, all of our minds are wired a particular certain way, right? Each person in this room has a unique combination of DNA that no one else on this planet has. And even if someone was your twin, you guys have different mitochondria DNA, right? So you have a unique set of talents, a combination of talents in your DNA that no one else has. And stored in that, you know, your job is to develop those talents into strengths. So you have to know, not only be able to identify it, but you actually have to be able to then develop the skill set and knowledge to further amplify it. But when you, when you actually do something where you can figure out something a little quicker than somebody else, or you have the impulse all the time to organize or to do certain things, those are probably giving you clues to where your talents lie. All right, Tom, you got a question? Yeah. So is that talent a innate or something that you could acquire. It's a name. It's a name. So it's like it's kind of born, you know. But you know, it's like, but we can still do something about it because if I if say if I have no talent, that could still um, work harder, you know, some training. For 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 the talent piece, it's basically what you're given. So another way to think about it is, in the way your mind processes information, your talent is a four-lane freeway that you can do 200 miles per hour on, right? Out of 100,000 thoughts that you have each day, your talents are maybe taking up a larger percentage of that. 
Now, you can have streets, you can have new pathways that your mind creates, but you only can go 25 miles an hour down that street, right? And for someone where that's a talent, it's a freeway to them. It's just, it's, it's natural. So one way to think about it is that if you, if someone gave you, take your favorite comedian, you know, and for me, it may be David Chappelle or whatever. Someone could give you all of their jokes and you can practice those jokes as much as you want. But if you can't feel the crowd and get that timing down, the timing, the tone, all of that, you're never going to even see the same success as them. That's their talent, right? They're able to deliver that much right at the right time to pull you in and then hit it, hit the punchline, right? So you, you kind of see what I mean? Is that like, that's, that's the level of something that's a strength of yours. But part of what the book is saying is that you should work on identifying your talents and develop those into strengths so you can be extraordinary at that way of thinking instead of focusing on your weaknesses because those will never be strengths. You learn how to manage your weaknesses, right? You learn how to find people that are on your team that have those as strengths and you have them part of your team. You, of course, you don't want your weaknesses to hinder you, but if you always, and I believe in this society, especially with the way that you know, jobs are gonna probably be progressing in the future, especially with AI, you know, your job is to be the best thinker that you can. And trust me, if you think like me, I don't need you. But if you think differently than me, I need you. So you have to be able to identify what's unique about how you think. And then you'll always have people or situations that want that energy of yours because you're your own unicorn, if that makes sense. Anybody have any thoughts or comments? Virtual man, you guys good? All right, so the homework assignment, if you choose to, because all of this we wanna actually get back to, how are we gonna utilize this to do well in our exams? So there's the, we have the, meet, we have the mental workspace, but number two is the recon mission. So one of the things that I did as a college student, uh, in particular when I was, uh, after I had transferred to the university, is if I could, I always tried, and my friends tried to sneak into the classroom where we were gonna have an exam the next day and study there. Like it seems like it's kinda, I don't know, weird or just different. But yeah, I would go to the seat that I was gonna be in that next day and we would just study, right? But before that, I had my own technique to prepare myself. So basically what I would do is I would sit in my seat and I would ask myself, what does it feel like sitting in this seat, right? Is the chair hard? You know, like how does it feel? Am I cramped up? Does it feel spacious? What do I see around me? So I'm visualizing everything around me. I see a board here. I see a poster here. I see whatever. What does it sound like, right? Do I hear noise in the background? What does it smell like in here? Am I in a lab setting? Do I smell benzene or something like that? But I would use four out of my five senses and I could be in that space and place myself there, right? So the second part of the assignment is how do you actually then use that information to turn up? So there's the pre-exam post energy exercise. So a night before my exam, I'm sitting in bed, I'm laying down, I move myself into that space, right? The classroom space. And then I would visualize the professor coming over, the TA coming over, handing me an exam, putting it down and saying, go. And I flip the exam over and I'm telling myself, ooh, you got this. Okay, I know the answer to this. I know the answer to that. I'm just going through that exam, just getting it, right? But again, I'm using that positive affirmation, right? I'm, I'm seeing myself get these answers right. But there's always those couple problems that, you know, maybe are going to help set that curve because they're, you know, they're going to expand your ability to make connections to those concepts of information. So for me, there's always those couple problems where I was like, damn, I can't figure these problems out logically right now. 
I've been spending 55 minutes on it. I can't figure it out logically. But then I would go into my mental workspace. And for that, for me, because the professor would come over, you have seven minutes left. You're like, oh, shit, what am I going to do? Right? You're over here. And, and, and what you don't want to do is this is the conscious part of your mind. And then this is, you know, the unconscious or where all your information lies, right? They have to talk to one another. You want to make sure this pathway is open so it can flow, right? It can flow here. But you don't want this mug to squeeze down <laughs> where you're like, oh, snap, I'm feeling the pressure right now. And then that information doesn't come from your mind into the conscious part of your mind, right? So I actually would move into the space where I'd be floating in the air and I'm like, time doesn't exist. So I'm floating in the air. I'm just like, Fred, think. Think, 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 think. You got this, just think. And I would just float. So when I moved into the space, I could be in this space for like five seconds, but it felt like 30 minutes because I'm really tuning out everything. And then what I also did in that moment too is I had faith that the information here, that it was present. And so I kind of borderline caught this cheating a little bit it's not cheating, but what I would do at that moment would be anything that came to my mind, I would write it down, right? I don't care about uh, thinking in a very linear way because I'm just trusting that my mind knows the information. So I would write this symbol down. I would write this thing. Down. I would just write things down in the margin. And all of a sudden, I'd be like, ooh, this is connected from here to here. Oh, this is. And then 85% of the time, I would nail those problems. But again, we all have superpowers and parts of our mind that will allow us to turn on our super mind. But some of that is going to be you trusting in yourself. And what this mental workspace does and what this exercise does is allow you to give yourself your best chance of not freezing up in the moment and visualizing yourself be able to nail those problems. So if you can connect this to the positive affirmations that we cover in, in the second part of the emotional self-awareness section on potential management, there's eight affirmations there. And those are part of the 40-day challenge of you guys beginning to then, you know, uh, reroute and to neutralize any negative programming. So you guys may be thinking, okay, all right. In my mind, I'm like, that was my, my little secret, right? That was like my little secret repping. But I, I was one of those persons when I was in college, I used to like to just talk to other people and see if anybody's thinking differently than me. And, you know, I would just try out stuff. So I was open to trying stuff out. There was one other person that I met that had a ritual the night before. And what he basically told me is that he was in a boxing ring with the information and he would box it. And then in the end, he would always knock it out. So I'm just saying what I'm saying. You gotta figure out what works for you. I gave this workshop as a, as a, um, as a class at Berkeley. And in that class, there was this one student that was like, Dr. Moore, Dr. Moore, you know, um, I tried this visualization technique and, you know, and I was taking this physics exam and I still froze up at the very end with those last problems. So I said, well, you need to go back over the steps that you took and figure out what step didn't work and how do you then modify that? How do you begin to change that? So he did, and like about three weeks later, he's like, Dr. Moore, he's like, I killed that. I was like, what? He's like, I killed it. I'm like, you killed what? He's like, he's like, I got an A on that physics exam. He says, I modified it, and it worked. In my mind, you know, all of these things that we're talking about and I'm bringing up are just different ways of thinking, right? Some of these things may resonate with you, and some of them may not. 
You know, my goal isn't to place any of this on you, but my goal is to give you the opportunity to identify your approach and your process to optimize your thinking. But you're gonna to have to put the work in. And what I'm also saying is that this is inner work, right? This kind of work isn't to get a good, isn't to get grades and courses. You know, like this not, this work isn't gonna be like, oh, I spent two hours doing this and therefore there's a direct correlation to X, Y, or Z. Like this is inner work so you can begin to really master your thoughts for life and to be able to turn on your instrument fully for life and to be able to organize your thoughts. So the stuff that you're learning now, you could use it five years from now or you could use it 10 years from now, right? We're playing the long-term game. This isn't high school where we're trying to learn something, you get an A on it and then you, the information skeets out afterwards. You're like, I don't need to know it anymore. No, you need to know everything that you're learning in these classes moving forward because you don't know when you may need that month again, right? Talk to me, y'all, I'm sure I was thinking. I think, um, Dr. Moore, you were mentioning how, like, um, how um, when you're taking an exam, for example, you're like, the, the, the problem, the answer exists, it's, it exists somewhere. And for example, my last exam, um, the first two questions were the hardest questions in the exam. And that kind of just like locked up. I was like, whoa, like, I don't know what to do. And then like later, I kind of just had to talk myself into like, hey, like, just it's not that bad. You just have to like figure it out. And again, the, the answer does exist. You just have to be open to it. But when you're like telling yourself like, oh no, like this is really hard, all this stuff, like it's just not going to come to you. Um, and this is just my experience from, from, from taking exams and just like being open to the information and being close to the information. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that, Kevin. Yeah, yes. And it's, um, you know, it's counterintuitive sometimes and people probably do this already, but you really should go through all the problems. You just read them first, even if you scan them quickly, but just to read them first, because our minds can process more than one thing at the same time. And so when you go back and look at that again, you're like, oh, okay, I think I have an idea of how to approach that. But some people, they do take the exam in serial, right? So like, I'm gonna do this one, I'm gonna do this one first, and then they waste so much time on the first two, and then they don't get through the other parts that are medium to easy questions, and then they're kind of like stuck with the grade that maybe doesn't represent what they actually know, right? And so, so yeah, like I, 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 wanna, I wanna make my mind have the, have the ability to process that in the background. And I always talk about, you know, the hardest class that I took in college, which was physical chemistry, and that's what happened during my actual final. It was six problems. Um, you had three hours to do six problems. You had your notes and you had the book, right? So at the end of the day, you know, if the person is giving you your book and you're opening it up during the final, you've already lost, right? Like you're not gonna read something in the book that you didn't learn before, integrated in real time under pressure to solve a problem you've never seen before. Like, no, right? He's just giving you that just so you can uh, have an emotional crutch, right? So I'm going through every single one of these problems, and I'm like, I don't know how to do this one. I don't know how to do any of these problems, right? And I was sitting there in my mind talking about, like, I was sitting there talking to myself, Kevin, you think I'm playing, right? I was talking to myself, and I was like, man, I'm about to get an F in this class, right? And it was like, hold up, friend. You, no, you ain't about to get an F. I'm like, man, I'm, I think I'm about to get an F in this class, right? So all I can do is say, I just want to get one problem right. If I get one problem right, I'm going to feel better about my F than like to get none of the problems right, right? So I spent like an hour on one problem, but I was like, I think I got that one right, right? Then I hit that second problem. I spent 30 minutes on that second problem. I was like, oh, I think I got that one right too. And Kevin, I got through them all. And I got them all right, Kev. But like, I had to let my mind go through its process, right? I had to let it just, and then I had to go to three universes above me and pull some information down and channel it because I was like, damn, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> but it's like, we all have the ability to go there. But part of that positive thinking, that positive talk has to be a part of it. 
Because I easily could have been like, oh, hell, I'm just done. And then you put the pencil down and you give up. And it's like, and I don't want to, I don't want to see you guys have to, you know, experience that. And if you do experience it, just learn from it, right? But there has to be a part of you that learns how to fight and be like, no, nah, I'm not going to just tap out. Like I'm, I'm going to go for it, right? I have nothing to lose. Any other thoughts? Comments? Um, so I'm, I've always been a really great test taker. One thing about me, I, I can do a test. Mm -hmm. um, so because I don't have the anxiety of like, oh, there's a test coming up. Mm -hmm. um, when I'm in the test and I do find problems that I'm like, damn, this, was the, this is from the section I was struggling in with the homework. So I was like, okay. Um, so I always try to start with the ones that I'm able to solve, just so I can get some positive, um, some positive emotion going. And then once I get to the ones where I was struggling, I'm like, okay, um, what was this related to before? Especially with uh, calculus, I've been like, all right, let's get rid of the cosine and tangent and all that stuff right now. If these were just simple algebraic equations, what would I do? And then it's like. I'm good at algebra. And then if you know, I'm like, okay, hold on. And then I'm able to take the problems if, uh, that I'm currently working on and be like, okay, is there any any rule changes now that I'm working with this element? No? Okay, well, here we are. And then um, somehow, some way, it gets solved. I'm like, well, that's, that's the end. So, yeah. No, thank you for sharing that. I really think that, like, for problems that are complicated, I just believe what worked for me is very similar to what you're saying. You have to go back to like, what do I know? Yeah. Like, how can I just start with this building? Like, what is, what is the foundation of what I know for sure? And then you have to just try to build upon it. Like, it's, and you have to link those concepts together in a way that makes sense based on deductive reasoning or inductive reasoning. But you have to start with, like, what do I know? Can I just start here? Because I know this for sure. And then if, if, this is, if this is correct, then this has to be correct too. And then you have to just link them and keep moving forward, right? I have something to say as, as to like that test staking. Um, and, you know, last semester I was just terrible, just awful. I was taking two like really hard, STEM classes and I was not doing well on my tests and I have like a lot of tests anxiety to where like I'm shaking um, as like I'm taking the test even though I, like I know the information I kind of just like freeze and then it all kind of just goes away um, but it's I can't test I think or what I want to say is that it's it's a skill it's like a muscle and it's almost like playing sports like the more you do it the more comfortable you're going to be the the better you're going to be at doing it so um the the difference that i've noticed and now i'm taking tests to where i can actually work through what i know um but it was taking kind of going back and taking um kind of not top tier classes but just you know classes that offer more like in class quizzes and things like that that can build like a little bit of pressure incrementally it's kind of like doing weightlifting or practicing sports, anything like that. But it's it's just getting yourself comfortable working on those muscles um, and figuring out, you know, how you are mentally, uh, how you can mentally prepare and how, uh, when it's game time, like how you deal with the pressure. Well, thank you for sharing that, Max. And I, 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 I completely agree with you. And, you know, this mental workspace and this kind of, you know, pre-exam imagery exercise is part of preparing the game plan, right? Um, but yes, part of the executional steps is taking practice exams before the real exam and timing yourself. After you believe you've done enough information, you believe you've mastered those few chapters or whatever it is for the next exam, saving one exam and putting yourself under pressure because 
It's a lot different sitting at Phil's Coffee with your feet kicked up or on your couch solving a problem than it is with that timer on you, right? I've said it before. There's the best chess player in the world with a clock, and there's someone different that is the best chess player in the world without a clock. The without the clock person can outthink you with unlimited amount of time, but the one with the clock can make better decisions under pressure. So it's a skill, right? Because when you put yourself, and I used to do this when I was an undergraduate, on the clock, and I'm sitting there, and I'm like, oh, what did that tutor say about this? Or the person I studied with, oh, they mentioned this? If I'm thinking about what someone else says, that means I don't know it. <laughs> right? Like, I'm moving outside of myself to pull some stuff, because I heard somebody say, I don't know it, right? So then I'm like, oh, I got to go back and like study this, because I don't really, really know it under pressure. But yeah, it's a skill. And I learned that the hard way. I probably learned that my second semester after transferring to Berkeley. And I lucked out my first semester because I had courses where I was in programs that gave us practice exams before the real exam. And they would actually make them harder than the real exam. But when I got to my upper division courses where I didn't have that, I'm like, I'm not even finishing these tests. I'm like, damn, what's up, right? I studied sufficiently enough, I'm doing the same thing, but I'm not finishing these tests. And I have to learn how to take practice exams and start to speed up my thinking because I'm not getting through these problems sufficiently enough. And then I was able to turn things around. I was like, there we go, snap. Anybody else? Thoughts, comments? Go ahead. So, when I turn my exam, like, um, I'll figure out the questions that I answered. But when I get my exam back, there's like some questions that I was confident in, but then it turns out there was another answer that was a better answer. And um, when you say better, the correct answer or? Correct answer. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. And so um, when I'm going about my exam and like I feel all this confidence that I got it correct. When you go back to double check it, how can you double check it in a way that like you kind of not like throw it away your confidence, but like um, make sure that you don't have mistakes that your false sense of overconfidence makes you think that it is entirely correct. Like, does that make sense? No, I got what you're saying. That's a really good question. I mean, what it comes down to is you having rigor around your thinking. And, I mean, when I say rigor, being extremely rigorous. So if you're winning, when you can take new information you're learning and connect it to old information, right? And it makes sense. But if you have new information you're learning and it does, it, it makes 85% sense, but not complete sense, that should bother you. That should send you on how do I figure out why that last 15% doesn't make sense? Is it because the existing information I learned, I didn't really, really understand it fully? Or is it the new information that I'm learning doesn't really connect fully to where I think it does? Right? But if you have rigor around when you're learning something, questioning everything and trying to make those connections to form a unified theory or integrating theory, then you'll catch those gaps a lot easier. But it's, sometimes it's hard to catch gaps all the time. So when you do get a problem wrong on an exam, Johnson, in my mind, that gives you an opportunity to grow. And you have to go back and be like, what was I thinking that made me believe I understood this? Right? How was I approaching this that allowed me to have some fault lines around understanding this concept. And then how do I make sure I put something in place where well, that never happens again? Right? If it happens once and you find ways to rectify that, then you may lose again, but hopefully you don't lose that same way. And then now you have another way if it does happen a different way to tighten up your defenses even more. 
So in the end, if you think about it from a place of it's an opportunity for growth, it also strengthens your mind each time you have a failure. It really does. And after a while, that machine in your mind starts to get tighter and tighter and tighter, right? We talked about having our mind be, you know, go through a process of machine learning, right? We have a mind, we have a processor, we have a chip in our mind that has its processing at a certain speed. Some people may be lightning fast, others may be a little slower, right? But at the same time, you know, we have software. So the software is, sometimes it has bad coding. Sometimes you miss decimal places. Sometimes you miss negative signs. Sometimes there's concepts that, you know, you don't necessarily understand completely. Sometimes you have emotions that make you believe you understand something because maybe there's parts of your self-esteem that's a little bit shaky in this area, so you overcompensate, right? Because our emotions can knock our machine off of, you know, operating as a fine-tuned machine. But each time, there's, again, you have a failure, if you look at it as an opportunity to grow and you figure out how to actually identify that code and then rewrite that mug, then all of a sudden, over years, it's a fine-tuned machine that just runs. It's just, and your mind and your thinking is more comprehensive anytime you do something. You're thinking about this, you're thinking about that, you're thinking about this, and you're just, right? Because you've had plenty of failures and you learn from all of them. You've been able to identify your approach and process and the steps you take to approach problems. You're looking inside of yourself and outside of yourself for better ways of thinking. And you're a fine-tuned machine. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I mean... Any other thoughts or comments or... Questions as we uh, close out this lesson? All right, so obviously this lesson took a little bit longer than I thought. So we're not gonna do the second lesson, but um, I really encourage you guys to um, go through this homework assignment process and figure out, you know, just try this. And if it works for you, then find ways to further sharpen it and amplify it. If it doesn't work for you, that's okay too. You were open to trying it. But I want you guys to uh, continuously, as students of science, be open to finding ways to be better thinkers, you know, to have more and a higher quality of thinking so you guys can turn on your mind fully and become extraordinary at your way of thinking and win easy instead of looking good, losing. All right? So go ahead now and take a, a few minutes and take the quiz um, for lesson 1.8 if you can. I want to show you guys can get credit for you know attending and whatnot. And afterwards, you guys have a great weekend. <laughs>